Good morning and welcome to Hardships. I'm Luingile. Today on the show, we'll be talking about sexuality and sexual health. And to help me discuss these issues, I have my three lovely guests and they'll introduce themselves. From what we understand, sexuality is the way people express themselves and it's all about attraction. It has nothing to do with sex as most of you people would want to define it as. And to help me understand more about sexuality, I'll ask my guests to introduce themselves, starting with the lady on my right. Okay, hello, uh, my name is Miles Moyo. I work for an organization called Voice of the Voiceless. We advocate for the rights of lesbian and bisexual women and trans persons. Um, my name is Caroline Mutsengi and I'm, from, I'm also from the organization Voice of the Voiceless and I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Chakwele Ndlovo. I'm coming from Usi Zoloma Kosigazi. A, a women's forum that we, a women's forum that gives platform to women of all sizes. Okay, welcome, ladies. Thank you. Um, I'll start with Jackie. Uh, what is who is responsible for teaching young women about sexuality? Okay, going back to where we come from, the traditional families that we come from the responsibility of teaching a young women about sexuality was solely in the hands of the aunties and the gogos. But due to migration and all the other various problems that we have faced as a nation, it has come back to mothers, sisters, and to church leaders, because that's where we spend most of our times in. Um, and what do you say, Carol? Um, I believe that it's important for young people to be taught about sexual health in the schools where they learn. I think it's, it's, it's imperative that they learn about sexual health from schools, but also I think so civic society plays a role in educating about sexual health and health care providers should also make it a priority to educate young people about sexual health. And um, so far, uh, like what Jackie was saying, that um, family uh, and uh, church leaders are supposed to be the ones who are at the forefront in teaching and educating um, young women on sexuality and also sexual health. Do you think they're actually playing that part in, in teaching? Um, there's a lot of, I guess, silence around conversations relating to sex, relating to sexuality, especially in churches and in families. Our African culture doesn't, does not really permit um, free conversation on, on those subjects. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the conversations have mostly been centered on abstinence. When you're talking about sexuality or sex, it's all just bunched into the word don't have sex. Mm -hmm. It's bad for you, you know, so this it's more or instilling the fear of sex in people but not really sharing the knowledge that is needed by young people these days because the world has evolved so much, the culture has evolved so much. So things that worked 20 years ago are actually not so relevant anymore. So I think churches and families are, are kind of failing to meet that gap of the 21st century young person and sexuality. Okay. And Carol, uh, looking at um, the society that we're living in um, and we're looking at how uh, it's evolving, why do you think it's actually important for young women to be taught or for young people to be actually taught about these issues? Well, I think it's important because only then can, I, I think specifically for young women, they would, need, they would be able to make more informed decisions about their bodies, which is something that's been lacking because there's a lot of policing of women's bodies by society. So it would be an emancipation of sorts for them to be able to make informed decisions about their bodies. And for their counterparts, the young men, I think it would be important for them as well to know how to treat women and to know how to take better care of themselves as well and to become more more 
innovative and more more able to to fully enjoy themselves sexually and their partners as well sexually okay and jackie what harm do you think those people who are exposing um young people and young women for say um in those programs where they're just saying not to sex or they have they are, they are um encouraging uh the abstinence let me say the abstinence gospel where people are being taught that no to sex you can't be talking about sexuality you can't be talking about sexual health it's a taboo in our culture that we have to be talking about these things even if we are talking to our mothers mm -hmm. it's not really that much in depth it's just on the surface what harm are they causing to us young women okay i'll just go back to an adage that i know it says knowledge is power and my sister carol said if you inform me i'll make sound choices but when we preach the gospel of abstinence we, we leave these young people to the mercy of social media and other forms of of medias that are showing sex for example if you don't talk about sex at home but then there is an advert on tv showing nude people already that's a subject on sexuality that they become curious of and abstinence in the generations that we are in is no longer sustainable because there's so much that they want to explore there's so much that they want to know and then when you you teach them of on abstinence you're already doing more harm than good you are leaving them at the mess of wolves rather tell them at home what they need to ex what they are you expect or what they will see in their bodies because there's a change in their body there's a change in how they feel or, 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 or attract attraction to the next person and even how they hold themselves the way or it has to be taught at home because we're taught good charity begins at home but if i don't tell them someone will go and abuse them in the name of sex and uh, don't you think that there are some people who actually think that the more you educate, the more you give uh, a young woman knowledge about this whole, uh, about sex or about sexual health, that's when they'll actually want to indulge, that's when they'll actually want to be curious, to, to explore their curiosity. Is that how people should see these things or it's all a myth? When you take a child to school, you are satisfying their curiosity on the worldly things. The more you tell them, the more they will want to, to explore, but at least they will make sound choices on how I want to protect myself. Because when you talk about sexuality and sexual health, there also come new topics on diseases unwanted pregnancies and the whole other broad, broad things that come into sexual health. But if I'm educated at home, I'm able to say, no, I can wait. No, I can prevent an unwanted pregnancy. But most of these young women make uninformed choices. And simple because at home, I'll go back a little bit and divert. In African homes where we come from, uh, we are encouraged even not to show our love to our spouses and our children because they, there is the perception that if you show love they'll end up being funny or they'll end up being stupid or whatever the black society has thought about showing expressions of love when we don't show them love and when we don't teach them at home someone will come to them and abuse them in the name of love someone will use their ignorance to manipulate them because there are so many people out there that simply because they have knowledge on something, they use it against you. And these are men and women out there that have knowledge. And if your child has diversional knowledge, they're going to be abused. Okay. And um, Miles, how do you think society can be more accommodative when we're looking at these issues, when we're looking at um, sexual health and we're, and we're also looking at issues of sexuality? How do you think society can be more accommodative in 
making sure that young women are taught about these issues with, whilst they're still young and they do not suffer from what Jake is saying, they do not, they do not get exploited by people who actually have the knowledge and abuse them. Okay, um, I think the first thing would be accepting that culture changes, the world changes. I think that's the first step. Uh, young people are having sex, that is the reality of it. And I think our parents need to find a way um, to accept that. Mm -hmm. We need to move away from the uh, talk to Malume, talk to Andy, uh, a kind of way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Because usually people are closer to their parents or their older sisters. So families actually, sex education or, yeah, needs to start in the home. Mothers need to start talking to their children, whether in Gaza and Bumfana, to start mm -hmm. talking to them about sex and sexuality as a whole. Mm -hmm. Because the other gap is when we're talking about sexual health or sexuality, it's always don't sleep with the men or and that's it. But we have young women that are not even sleeping with men, but are sleeping with women. They are exploring already in Zimbabwe and their parents have no idea. Mm -hmm. At school, so even if a young person has questions, there's no way to go and talk about that. Mm -hmm. I know we're very we're a conservative country, yes, and even the curriculum on sex education, it's basically on the reproductive system and on menstrual, not even menstrual health, but just menstruation in Jepela Konalapu. And if I remember from being at school and learning about that, it didn't even make sense. And So the curriculum in schools needs to change. Ministry of Education, and I guess Ministry of Health, because mm -hmm. they kind of link um, on this topic, need to really sit down and revise that. Mm -hmm. And I remember even there used to be these clubs that you'd have after school where you'd meet and talk about different things. So there's also maybe they could open room in schools to discuss everything that is related to sex mm -hmm. and sexuality as a whole. Because the problem is it's um, the, the view of sexuality and sex is rather narrow-minded and it doesn't apply in 21st century Zimbabwe or anywhere in the world really. Mm -hmm. So people need to start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, having the uncomfortable discussions. I know we think, ah, I'm not only 13 years was in, but a 13 year old is having sex. And if you are going to preach, I don't have sex, but they are, then at least start talking about prevention and protection because we're talking about ending HIV mm -hmm. but we're not going to do that if we are uncomfortable having the discussions that we need to have so I think that is the first step adults especially 40s going up mm -hmm. really need to start getting comfortable because they are the ones they are the parents and they're also the teachers they are the people that are looking after young people they are the people that young people look up to mm -hmm. so they need to be the to be willing to be open-minded to really start having conversations, having programs that are comprehensive. Okay. I think that's what is lacking, a compre comprehensive approach to sexual health, to sexuality, because there is so many things, you know, because Kangela, you still, there's still the focus on HIV and STIs. And then you forget these things like cervical cancer, which is now actually a, a really big deal, but young women have no idea but what's uh, happening with several cancers, what do they need to do, what do they go to get uh, screened, is not in Jalo. So I think we just need a comprehensive package, a comprehensive approach mm -hmm. to addressing these issues. Yeah. And what other major issues do you think they need to be discussed uh, when we're looking at sexual health and sexuality, Carol? Um, well, I think the main, the main, thing that needs to be discussed when it comes to sexuality is sexual rights because in, in as much as sexuality is about expression and experience or as a sexual being it is important to know that you have rights tied to your sexuality specifically to your sexuality because a lot of and I think mainly young women don't know that they actually have rights that pertain to their sexuality because it's, 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 it's very important also that people understand 
both young men and young women understand that their bodies have certain ways that they need to be treated, respected, not only by themselves but by other people. That people have certain limitations when it comes to their bodies. People don't have access, full access to their bodies because this is what happens when people are exploiting young people sexually. It's because these young people don't know that they have certain rights tied to their sexuality. And I think it's also important when it comes to sexual health to have more comprehensive service from healthcare providers because right now the the health care that is provided, the sexual health care that is provided is is not really comprehensive for everyone. It needs to be all inclusive, all encompassing, including LGBTI persons, including inclusive of sex workers, because there are a lot of young people who are engaging in sex work. There are a lot of young people who have multiple sexual partners having casual sex they need to be cognizant of all those things and help them make more informed decisions so that they are not exploited and they are not putting themselves at health, at health risks of any kind they need to 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 healthcare service providers need to have comprehensive programs for young people and if possible, as what has been done for HIV, to have peer educators at these at, at healthcare service provision centers. I think it's important to have peer educators that also deal with sexual health in all its broadness and in, in every way that it in, it's inclusive of everyone. And these people need to be young people as well because these it's easier for young people to, to engage amongst themselves and these young people need to be invested in by, in, in by providing them with adequate information so that they can share with their peers. Okay. Yeah. And Jackie, let's, uh, you mentioned earlier that church leaders are, we are one of the people that we actually look up to uh, who can give us information in terms of sexuality and, and sexual health but then uh, when we look at it um, we go to a church, we go to church and we approach these leaders, we approach the elders or uh, our mentors at church and we talk about uh, the different people that we, the someone that we are attracted to but then the person is not, um, does not appeal to society and uh, it, maybe it's a woman being attracted to a woman or it's male being attracted to a male. Um, how does that affect um, if, if the elder rejects the way the way you are attracted to someone else how does it affect the person who actually approaches the elder well I'll, I'll just go back because we are talking about church and church is founded on on the bible when peter asked jesus about the greatest commandment he says imteto love your god with all your heart and with all your understanding and love yourself, the, love your neighbor the way you love yourself. Uh, I think churches need to, to accommodate and, and really it, preach and, uh, and do what they preach. Because when we go back to the Bible, but the Bible talks of love that covers a multitude of sin. It talks about not condemning someone because of what they have done and lift you shouldn't even judge. So elders should should really become part of the comfort because society has really been discriminative. But churches should be self spaces as well, where people of different sexual orientations should go and find comfort. As an elder, I would encourage them to give love because that's what we need out of everything. With these young people, young women and young men are going through a stage that they can't even understand themselves. They are coming to terms with how they are attracted to a person of the same sex. They are coming into a journey where they don't know how society will accept their decision. They are coming from families that are threatening to banish them. But as church leaders and and other spiritual entities, we're supposed to give them comfort. We're supposed to, 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 to embrace them. 
and give them the love that the world has not offered. And one of the other things that, that comes back is what each church is to keep the hateful words towards a person who has chosen to, 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 to break the norm. Because what is normal to us is the hetero heterosexual relationship where men and a woman are together. But we are failing to accept that a woman can have a woman as a, as a friend or can have a man, a man relationships. But we should really embrace them. We should not judge. At least we, we bring condemnation to those people and to ourselves. And moving forward, the church needs really to step into the gap. Because when you're looking at it, Kodala a religion, we used to go to church on Sunday and that would be all. Now you find in homes there is Monday prayer, there is Tuesday prayer, there is Wednesday prayer, there is Thursday prayer. Half of our lives, because we are running from the hateful world, we are in church. And church should bridge the gap, especially in teaching a young woman about sexuality and sexual health. These are the people that we should go to with all our problems and they should be counselling us instead of condemning us. So I encourage the church to fully embrace a person not because of their sexual orientation. Okay. Um, Miles, can you explain to me um, what your organization does in helping um, young women in terms of their sexuality? Um, okay, so we work specifically with lesbian and bisexual women and transgender persons. Uh, Zimbabwe is very homophobic. I think it, it, it's rooted in our culture, in almost every institution that exists in this country. So there isn't that many safe spaces for people that identify as LGBTQ or I. Uh, what we do is we create safe spaces for people to just come together and talk about whatever issues are affecting them. This could be in their families, at school, uh, at work, or just about something that happened when you were walking in the street or in a bar. So considering the, the hate and discrimination that exists already, there's a lot of things that we normally don't get to talk about or things that we, uh, we can't get help for. For example, if you're being uh, abused by a partner, you can't go to the police and report that. There's no protection for LB, LGBT people if they are in, they are being abused in a relationship. So it, it takes a toll on someone's mind. You know, it, it's very stressful. You're dealing with your own identity and navigating yourself as a person in a world that doesn't want you. Yeah, you find a lot of people are stressed. Uh, people can be depressed. Uh, some people even try to commit suicide. So mental health is really a big factor for people that, uh, for LGBTI persons. So as an organization, we create safe spaces where people can firstly uh, be comfortable and also then talk about the issues uh, that are affecting them. And we also refer them for counseling. If they feel they want to talk to someone they don't know, sometimes it's easier to talk to a stranger. You're more comfortable and I think you feel less judged and you know, yeah. And also there is a factor of confidentiality because some of the things, that are, the issues are really personal and, and sensitive. So it's easier if someone just goes to, and talks to someone outside the, um, uh, the LGBTI community. Okay. And considering not just the stress of your identity, but right now I think our country is stressful for a lot of people looking at the economy and the political environment. You're worried because you don't have a job, you're worried because you don't have money to buy bread. And then on top of that, you have to worry because, okay, maybe you need to go to the clinic, but you're afraid just because you identify as lesbian or you identify as gay. So there's all these uh, difficulties coming from different aspects of your life and not really that many spaces to go seek help. So we have what we call wellness and, and self-care as one of uh, the aspects of our work. It can just be something as simple as, let's come together and watch a movie. Or let's, play, let's come together and play soccer, or let's play music and dance, or let's go and have a pride. Just to have time where 
We are not worried about people hating you. We are not afraid someone's going to shout Tabani or someone's going to beat you up. So because Abani Bahala is in the way, it's unacceptable. And they're not really safe in those homes. So they have to be someone else when they're at home. They have to be someone else when they're at their work. So, and when they come to us, that's the place where they can just be themselves and really be honest with themselves and also with other people, which I think is a, is a very important element for one's mental health. Yeah. And Carol, what kind of, um, do you offer any sort of um, health assistance uh, for people who come and seek assistance from your organization as a safe space? Do you also offer any help in terms of counseling them in, in sexual health and, sexual edu and sex education? Because for some people they might be confused, they do not know how, uh, they do not know how to actually define their sexual orientation, they'll be confused. So do you offer any help on that? Okay, um, what what we do is we have sessions with 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 our stakeholders, with our beneficiaries who are the LBTQI persons. And in these sessions we start from the very basic things which are the different terms that are associated with sexuality. Like sexual orientation, what are the different sexual orientations, what is gender identity, what is gender expression. So we, we talk about those very basic things. And then we also, in those sessions, discuss coming out and the different stages of coming out. So it's, it's also to the understanding that in coming out, the first stage is to come out to yourself to accept yourself and know yourself, who you are as a person. What is your sexual orientation? What is your gender identity? So it's, it's, it's a very open space where people get to really interrogate themselves, to say, who am I? And, and we help people in that, through that journey by equipping them with information because I, we don't believe in imposing sexu uh, sexual orientation on a person. Only a person knows who they are and we only give them the information they need to make a decision as to who they to to make a more informed decision and more in, to make to give a more informed definition of who they are because in terms of who they are they know it but they just don't know what it's called in most cases so it's just a matter of us guiding them through that process of of better realization of who they are and understanding themselves and in terms of health services, I think our main focus has been mental health, like Miles was saying. We refer people for counselling. We also do a bit of counselling ourselves, like peer counselling, very informal, very unstructured. Just when someone comes in with a problem and they call and they say, I, want, I need to talk to someone like me, we can do that in a very confidential space. So it's, it's, it's also something that we do to, to sort of help with mental health. But also we've had sessions on hygiene because it's important for issues like cervical cancer. You find that a lot of cervical cancer or even breast cancer is, to do, is from high, poor hygiene. So we have sessions on hygiene and how it's tied to health. Just in terms of as women, how do we bath? How do we wash certain areas? How many times do you need to wash your bra a week? Things like that, very basic things that you find actually affect other women who are not lesbian or bisexual. And also in terms of the trans men, also discussing with them that they need to wash their binders. They need to wash the clothing that they wear underneath because it's important as well. So it's, 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 it's a lot to do with mental health. That's the kind of health service that we offer. But we also do discuss general health, like physical health as well. Okay. Yeah. And Jackie, why do you, from what they have been saying, why do you think an ordinary person should be informed of um, another person's sexual orientation? Or why do you think someone should be informed on sexual health? 
Okay, sexual orientation, you don't need to be informed of it. That it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey where you realize who you are. No one needs to, to impose it on you, like they said. Carol said they're not imposing sexuality on anyone. This person comes in a, a confused state of discovering who they really are. They just help the transition. It's not about imposing because you can't tell me to be lesbian when I'm not. It's a, it's a journey that you walk alone. Then on issues to do with sexual health, there's a greater need for us to be informed so that we make also informed choices. Because we, we are told that when you're forewarned, you are forearmed. You know what to expect, you know how to handle yourself, you know even what to do in cases where a mistake has happened or an accident. Looking at it, uh, Miles touched on a, a rather sensitive issue that our 13 year olds are having sex. That simply means the health care facilities should evolve to cater for, for, for the new sex adventures that, adventurers that are coming. Because you realize what uh, in most of the self spaces that we offer young women, like I told you, I work with young, both young and old women. A, a young woman will tell you that I was deprived of condoms or family planning methods simply because the nurse told me that I was too young. That's one thing because of where we're coming from. I can't discuss sex with my mama Michias Lapan. Young women are having STDs, but they can't go to the clinic because and so really our healthcare facilities should evolve such that they become even safe spaces for young women because I found in, in, in families that we're coming from it's easier to talk to a stranger who is welcoming than a mother who is beating you so really I think what Carol said, in our clinics, we need young people to occupy those spaces where they can offer peer-to-peer -peer counseling. They can also teach other people how to use condoms. We have old men, very old, 40 years, and they can't even wear a condom. And how will they prevent themselves from HIV? But if you teach a young man at the age of 13, 14, on how to wear a condom, it becomes their lifestyle. If we teach a young woman how to, to take family planning prevention methods, that woman will see her through university rather than her dropping out because of an unwanted and an unplanned pregnancy. We will not have young people getting HIV or, 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 or other STIs because that woman knows her choices. She knows even how to confidently tell a young man to wear a condom. I was laughing the other day, a friend of mine asked me, are you confident to go and buy condoms at Choppies? I said, simple because I'm a young woman who knows where she's going. I will gladly buy a pack of condoms at any shop at any given time. But we have young women that when a young man says, I don't have condoms, they say, I am Zakupela, because they don't know what else to do. So people really need to be taught on sexual health, really need to be taught on the correct and consistent use of these preventative methods. So I think really we still got a journey in teaching and bringing awareness to the young people because by now we should have eradicated HIV, but it's still one of the sketches that are sweeping the whole of Africa. Okay, thank you so much ladies. I had a good time and I, I learned a lot uh, from what you have been saying. Um, do you have any last words that you can tell the viewers out there in terms of uh, sexual health and everything that you have been discussing? I'll start with you, Miles. Um, I think the most important thing is to understand that the world has changed and also to always seek knowledge. I know it's not always that someone is going to come and teach you, but it's important to discover things. There's the internet and there's all these organizations and so the, the information is there. So it's important to seek information and seek it with an open mind to really understand and learn different ways in which people live. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, um, I think in closing I would say what's important is for young people and I think everyone in general is to make informed decisions and you can only do that when you have the information. So like Mal said, seek information but also utilize it. Don't just get information and put it under your cupboard like getting a pamphlet and letting it just gather dust. Utilize the information and understand that that information was crafted for you to be a better individual when you're equipped with it. So I think it's important as well that people take better care of themselves so that they are healthier beings. Yeah. In closing, I'll just say, uh, as young women, we should empower ourselves and be assertive. Do not be idle as a young woman, because that's when you are the mess of them that are going, to, are going to exploit you in any way, whether physically or sexually. But let us be young women that are ready to take over the world. Young women that are occupying all spaces. We should break from patriarchy. Men and women are at par. We are equal beings, given all the organs that are there just to empower ourselves. We should not be at the mercy of men, but we should really make choices based on what we want, not what the world is imposing to us as young women. I'm sure you all heard what those ladies had to say and um, I'm sure that from now on you'll make informed decisions in terms of your uh, sexual health and from me Lou it's bye for now and I'll see you next week. <laughs>